Hello folks, today we're going to be embarking on a bit of a water cooling adventure because we're doing something I have never done before and it should be rather exciting because we're going to be taking a radiator and building it directly into a distro plate by which I don't mean adding some fittings onto the end and putting it into a distro plate, it's easy. I'm talking about taking the end cap and completely replacing it with a distro plate so that it basically floats in place. Now that Sounds like it should be pretty exciting. Now I want to preface with the fact that you can't just use any radiator on the market for this sort of mod. And that's because most of them are built like this XT45 here with the tanks brazed onto the ends of the heater core. Now the problem with that is this isn't removable and it means you can only deal with what's sort of currently connected, in this case a load of ports, so you'd have to use fittings. Now I don't want to do that. I want to plumb it directly. So that means I need a radiator more like one of these, which is a Barrow Chameleon Fish. And what this does differently is it has a removable end tank. Uh, now this is actually a 3D printed one that I use just to check all my measurements, but it basically just slots onto the end like so, allowing you to remove it. And it also comes in different options. So if you wanted to buy one of these, you can get one either in acrylic or in acetal. So I've got an acetal one and I use that as my basis. You've also got ones from Aqua Computer that are sort of older and I did consider using one, but the problem is they're very big, they're very expensive, uh, they're kind of difficult to get hold of nowadays. Um, and there's a lot more work to connect everything up just because of the way that the uh, tubes and all of the internals are arranged. So I figured this would be easier, lighter, and also if it just doesn't work, it's a little bit cheaper, I'm not gonna be that worried. Unfortunately, being quite cheap, um, there are a few oddities, so I couldn't get the one without the screens. I don't really want screens on the sides here, but uh, this was the only one I could get hold of in time. I also could only get the black finish one rather than the silver like I wanted. So this is why I had to spend the beginning of the video stripping the anodizing off with that. Now, if you want to know how to do that, we do have a video exactly on it. So click the card and you'll be able to see exactly how. It's very simple. You just need to use some sodium hydroxide solution and it comes straight off. One thing I'm not so keen on is this great big dent over here. Um, I don't think that's going to go into the coolant channels. It doesn't look like it's affected it, but it's a little bit nasty looking. And uh, the reason why it's there is they've got this silly little screen that sort of presses in against it. And I don't want this, so I'm just going to throw that away or maybe use it some other place, um, which means I've now got some nice dented fins. So I, that's a bit of a shame. However, one bonus is these do look really rather nice. And actually, I didn't need to refinish them in the glass blaster to be able to match the finish in the rig. So that's quite convenient. So it came out quite well with all of the anodizing. 
but we've got a lot of work to do. So the way I'm going to try and play this one is by making a distro plate on the back here that slots into the existing geometry of the uh, rear panel. So I've got screw mounts and things already built into that to do that. And then I'm going to have this side over here, which has the cap. That's going to go and sit sort of like so. And then of course I'll put all of the frames back on. And then interestingly enough, what we're going to have on the distro plate is mounts are going to have the tubes are going to go here into the motherboard. And then there's going to be another tube which comes around the back into the mid plate distro. And then there's going to be another distro plate that runs along the back over here from one side all the way over to the front to the top of the reservoir. And that's going to be connected using my special distro plate connectors. So we're going to be getting plenty of use out of those. Should be pretty exciting. In terms of construction, we're going to do one layer, which is going to be 8mm um, sort of clear acrylic, and then we're going to use one layer of 10mm frosted, so we'll get that nice sort of milky look. I'll put the frosted on the outside since it matches up rather nicely with this. I'm not going to put any LEDs in here, um, because I don't think it's really going to need it. It's going to be right next to the motherboard, it's going to be on the front. Uh, this part here is actually going to be underneath a lot of stuff, so I wanted this to be uh, lit up nicely from the inside but over here probably isn't going to need it. So I'm just going to leave them out on this one uh, because they actually take up quite a lot of room. And I don't really want the cables to go all the way from over here to the Quadro and things. It would be much simpler without the LEDs there. So what we now need to do is get on with the machining. So I've got it all tool pathed up and we're going to start off with the frosted acrylic and then we're going to move on to the clear and then we have to do the double sided ops for both. And I'll explain a little bit closer when we get there what needs to be done.
now got the parts off from op one and I am really pleased with the finishes. So the edges I did a little bit differently to normal. So normally I use a six millimeter tool, which is really good for slotting. However, because these parts over here all have quite tight radii over here, I can't use a six millimeter in these. So I used my four millimeter. Now, the thing about the four millimeter is that it's not so good at taking a full depth of cut uh, along the size of say a 10 millimeter piece like this. So instead what I did is I divided it in two and I used a bit more coolant as per the, one of the suggestions on the community tab and I think it really worked. So I noticed that the additional coolant didn't make that much of a difference for the uh, floor finishes here and they've always been quite good so I think chip evacuations may be the main issue here. Uh, and adding that extra coolant because it gets soaked up by the chips I think it's really helped with the edges. So that's great so thank you very much for the suggestion and I did take a look into it and I think it's paid off. But now we need to focus on OP2, which I'm hoping is actually going to be quite a simple one. Because for the most part, what we're doing are counter bores on this side, uh, along with a single chamfer. And then for the clear part here, we're going to be doing chamfers around the outside and then some O-rings. So I need to have O-ring uh, slots here for the radiator to be able to fit in. And it's kind of interesting because the actual stock radiator O-rings are different. They didn't use the same one for the top and the bottom. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but um, because I don't know why that is, I decided I may as well just copy what they've done um, because that probably seems like the safest idea. So the top one needs to have a 1.2 millimeter depth and the bottom one needs to have a 1.4 millimeter depth. And interestingly enough, these use a different kind of O-ring size as well. So they're thinner than the ones that I normally use. So I'm going to be using one of these, which is a 1.5 millimeter cutter. So I use that for the O-rings on this side here, just to reduce my tool changes. Uh, these are quite small, but on acrylic, eh, it's not really a worry. It should be fine. And I'm just going to do it in exactly the same way that I normally do it. I'm going to do like a roughing pass and then I'm going to measure it. And then I'm going to adjust it on the machine to make up for that. Now, one question I am asked quite frequently is how exactly do I handle my second ops? Because it's not always that obvious in the videos. Now, the reason for that is because obviously if I'm doing a lot of the filming, it's quite tricky trying to manage both doing the coordinates exactly right and maneuvering the camera to make sure things are in view and all that. So I'd rather prioritize getting the op right because obviously if I get that wrong, it's game over. But it's also not that difficult. I use a few different systems and I thought I'd just explain them to you now. So the first one that you would have seen me use uh, a while back when I'm doing larger panel work or multiple parts is I use the coordinates that I've sort of baked into my fixture plate itself. So when I first built this, um, I used a coordinate system to build it and then I saved that system, uh, which means that I can then access it again in the future and basically plug stuff into my bed and then put it up on the computer and it should know pretty much exactly where it is. Now the one issue there is that things can go wrong. I use stepper motors on this machine and you can lose steps, you can go out of square, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, and I've noticed that can introduce quite a bit of inaccuracy. Uh, so you have to check for it and make sure that everything's properly calibrated every so often. And I, for the most part, it works fine, but I have noticed that maybe on some larger parts, it's a little bit tricky and if you need to be really, really exact, sometimes it's a bit hit and miss. So to get around that, most of the parts that I've been doing for Aquacaris, I've been using one of these, which is a manual edge finder. So anyone who's a manual machinist out there and has like a vertical mill will be very accustomed to these, but this is a little mini one. Now the tricky thing with my machine is that I actually don't have very much Z travel at all. I've got very, very little. And on top of that, what makes it even harder is that my spindle only uses ER11 collets, which means that I can only use up to eight millimeter shank tools. Now most uh, 3D probes and similar, uh, or even manual edge finders are 10 to 12 millimeters across, which means there's no hope of me using one in this machine. There are some smaller edge probes that you can use, However, they tend to be quite deep. So the issue there, of course, means that they're either gonna hit my bed, because I've chucked off 20 millimeters or so from my Z height just by using my fixture plate. And if I put, say, a clamp on top of this and I do other things or I'm using thick material, there's just no hope. I won't be able to probe on the top of round things. So to get around that, I got one of these, and this is made by Proxon, and they do a lot of small kind of home workshop tools and actually these work really fantastically because they use a six millimeter shank so I can use them in my most commonly used collets so I can get some really nice accurate coordinates with that. Now 
One issue is that you have to use these with very low RPMs. They are designed for manual mills, and those tend to operate on the lower RPM range rather than a router, which is busy blaring away at sort of like 20,000 RPM. This can only go up to about 400, 500 or so. Now, luckily for me, I have full control over my spindle speed, so I can use that. So I've just set it in my um, control software. When I'm doing my probing, I just set it down to be 250 RPM, and it works very well. If, however, you've got something more like a Shapoko and you're using uh, a DeWalt router or a Makita router, then these will not work, and that's a bit difficult. So you're going to have to work out exactly which systems will be appropriate for that. But for this sort of system with a proper VFD, actually it works incredibly well, and I've been getting some pretty good repeatability with these. It takes a little bit of time, but it's definitely worth it. Now, by far and away, the most difficult part for this second op is going to be the work holding, because a, this is a bit of a funky shape, and B, I'm actually going to be doing a lot of exterior chamfer work, and also all of these are going to be counterboard, which means that actually the tool is going pretty much all over the place. So clamps are a bit of a tricky one. Now I would like to put a clamp here. I've got a chamfer there. That's no good. I'd like to put a clamp here. There's a chamfer there. I put a clamp here. No, it's going to be interrupted by tool paths. It's going to be dangerous. So instead, what I'm going to do is go for a bit of a compromise here and just make use of the fact that this is all very light cutting. So I'm going to just use double-sided tape. Now for my bed, this actually works fine because double-sided tape works really well on a setal. So I've got it pretty flat. Obviously there are some marks in it now, but it's flat enough to use for this. And you get a very strong bond. In fact, it's so strong, sometimes it's very difficult to remove the part. I'm going to have to be very careful to make sure I don't snap anything. But it does do quite a good job if you're doing light cutting work like we're going to do. Now I will say though, as well as this works, it's absolutely rubbish if you have an MDF spoil board. So if you're doing this on your own machine at home, I wouldn't really recommend it. The super glue method is better. I just don't want to do that now because it's a bit risky doing super glue on here because if it bleeds between any of the tape, then I have basically fused my part to the bed and I will not be able to rescue that finish. But if you're doing it on a MDF spoil board, then the problem with the tape is that it can take the very top layer of the MDF off. And I mean like a really fine layer, just be like a powder. And then it will just rip your part off and be absolutely useless. And I did have that happen a couple times before I had this plate. So it definitely makes things a lot easier. Ideally, I'd like to use some edge clamps. But again, this is the problem with the material because it's actually quite bendy. So if you clamp from the edge on acrylic, especially a piece like this, it's just going to warp in the middle of it and then probably just pop off the bed as well when the tool comes down. So I know that the tape is going to work. I'm going to give that one my best shot and it shouldn't move around. And just to help with that, what I'm going to do is all the precision work first when it's nicely firmly held and then anything else after that shouldn't matter quite as much.
Well, I think it makes such a big difference having the radiator in now. Uh, and remember, this is only the first radiator. We're going to have a second one at the front, and then we're going to have all the distro plates and the reservoirs and things, and plus all the wood panelling later on. So I think it's really starting to take shape now, and the final dimensions are starting to be approached. So it's getting rather interesting indeed. Now, that's not to say that everything went well. Actually, the distro plate all went fantastically well. Nothing went wrong with that. This radiator, though, is actually a piece of crap. Uh, it's already broken. I need to get a new one because the little screws uh, is on the, basically on the back of the end cap. Um, they have these uh, sort of standoffs. And the problem is they can shear off. Now, I didn't even get to torque down the screws and they sheared, so I guess there must have been some stress in there already. But that's really quite disappointing. So I guess maybe I'll just have to get another one because now I've committed uh, and then see and hope for the best that that one doesn't break as well. But if I were you, I wouldn't get one personally. Uh, if you do want this sort of modular radiator type thing, avoid this cheap rubbish one and uh, get the proper aqua computer ones. And I would have gone for that one, except they're just difficult to find at the moment. And um, they're just so big. They're very, very thick. And they're actually not very good radiators. They don't perform particularly well, but they are very solidly built, which is more than I can say for this one. In fact, something quite funny happened earlier when I was testing it out, because I wanted to find out whether or not it would still hold water or not. So I used the EK Leak tester to do some air testing and uh, it actually pushed one of the screws straight out of the back. So this is one of the screws that was spinning in its standoff and obviously not connected to anything, and it just went thump, straight out of the back, uh, which is very, very disappointing and a bit of a problem, but I did have to laugh, and at the end of the day, it's not a really big deal. None of the work that I've done today is going to be wasted by this, uh, but it is a bit of a frustration, and it's not very nice when things just break when they've got nothing to do with you. But that said, it's still a pretty cool look, and I'm glad that I decided to give it a go. Now, I mentioned a few of the things that I'm going to be doing on this, but I'm also going to be making some DDC heat sinks, I think. Yes, I did hear you, and actually, yeah, you're right, the finish could be a lot better, and I think if I try making some, it could be a fun little project in on itself. Plus, I'd be able to use them in the future, potentially, so it could be quite fun. I think we should give it a go. Now, of course, you wouldn't want to miss any of that, now would you? So the best way to stay up to date is, of course, by subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. You can also find us over on Instagram, Facebook, builds.gg, and Twitter. We also, of course, have our Discord server linked down below, so if you want to pop in, say hi, and have a chat, it's a great place to hang around. Also, don't forget to check out our merchandise store if you'd like to support the channel. Have a browse and see if anything strikes your fancy. Take care, folks, and I'll catch you next time.